Good morning, class. It is your teacher, Mr. McMillan, and I want to welcome you to our very first virtual ELA Live class. I know it is so much going on, but I hope that you guys are staying safe and that you're sheltering in place. All right, let's get started, shall we? All right, let's go over our slides. First thing first, I would love if you guys take out your vocabulary sheet and take out your notebooks. Take out your vocabulary sheet and take out your notebooks. I want to welcome you to our virtual ELA class. This is like the first time we're doing something like this, and this is really, really cool. Um, but what I want you guys to do, being that we are actually here in quarantine and you are with your families and you guys are not able to go outside and play and you know do all these cool things that you might want to do, I want you guys to journal each and every day. This unit originally was supposed to be when we read Anne Frank, and we're gonna read about her journey within the secret annex that she couldn't go anywhere she couldn't do all the normal things that she's used to doing like playing around like hanging out like doing all these amazing things she wants to do for a 12 and 13 year old and you guys are in the same shoes but what i want you guys to do you're not quite in the same shoes because you're not running away from your own for your own life in a in the perspective of the germans but you are counting, you're staying away to save yourself, save your relatives. You're staying home, you're staying safe. And by doing that, you're staying, you can't really go out and do things with your friends as you may like to, but it is okay. So what I want you to do each and every single day for at least, at least a couple of minutes, give yourself maybe five minutes a day. I want you to journal. I want you to write about everything you're doing that day, okay? What are you doing that day? What is going on that day? What are some things that may be bothering you? What are some things that may be great for you? What are some things that are helpful? And I want you to take that time to write those things down. And then you're going to, by May 29th, when you collect all those journals at the end of your seventh grade year, I want you to mail, we're, I'm going to show you how to mail me all of your journals. And you're going to send me your journals. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them and I'm going to write you something special. And I'm going to send you a, a gift for completing the seventh grade. And that will be my way of saying, you guys have completed the seventh grade. You guys are a pretty tough class because you were the only class that had to experience finishing seventh grade in quarantine. All right. But guess what time is it now? It is time for vocabulary words of the week. So please write down each word with the proper definition on the vocabulary handout and write it in the order that we usually have it. The word, the definition, five times each, and how it is used in a sentence. A lot of you guys have been doing so well by taking pictures of the work you've done before and sending them to me. I want you guys to do that again, okay? First word. It's our bonus word. But those who do not watch the video, they won't get the bonus word. But those of you guys who are watching the lecture and the video, you will get the bonus word. And the bonus word this week is poetry. Poetry is defined as literary works in which special intensity is given to the expression of feeling and ideas by the use of distinctive style and rhythm. Poems collectively or as a genre of literature. For example, I gave you guys two poems here. The first poem is, roses are red, violets are blue, God made me pretty, and what happened to you? Or how about this one? Ice cream. Ice cream in a bowl, ice cream in a cone, ice cream anywhere I want, as long as my, it's my own. Ice cream can be sticky, ice cream can be sweet, ice cream is delicious, it's my very favorite treat. Those are poems. You might know a couple of poems yourself. Now let's get into our first full vocabulary word. Now our first word is metaphor. Now before we get into these words, a lot of you guys may wonder, Mr. McMillan, why in the world are we using words that are uh, 
that goes with poetry. Because on Wednesday, we're going to be looking at poetry. We're starting a new unit, and it's going to be focused on poetry and literature. And so today, we're going to be focusing more on literature. But on Wednesday, you're going to be looking at some poems. And I'm going to want you to look at these to find examples of how these words are used. So first word would be metaphor. Now, metaphor is defined as a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. For example, Franklin has a heart of gold. Now, obviously, we know that his heart is not golden, but it is a phrase that is applied to an object or an action in which it is not literally ad- applicable. It kind of reminds you of a simile, right? Because if it was written as a simile, it would be Franklin is like... Has a, has a heart like gold, right? Or here's another metaphor. Mary's voice is music to my ears. Instead of saying, Mary's voice is like music to my ears. He's a walking encyclopedia. He knows so much he is as an encyclopedia, right? Which would be a simile, but a metaphor is just saying, he's a walking encyclopedia, right? Next word is a stanza. A stanza is a group of lines forming from basic reoccurring reoccurring metrical unit in a poem or a verse. Now, let me explain. If you've ever seen stanzas before, when you look at a a, a song, um, you look at the lyrics, when you're looking at the song, you're trying to look up uh, the lyrics to Roddy Rich the Box, and you are looking, you see that he got one verse here and then it takes a break and it gives you another verse here and it gives you another verse here those in poetry are called stanzas so a stanza is a group of lines in a poem and it is often called a verse so for example if you look at this poem to your right um today is your luck it reads today on your birthday consider your luck you could have been born a pig or cow or a duck that is the first stanza then we take a break and a pause. We go into the second stanza where it says, you could have been born a crying oink quack or moo. You're lucky you didn't wind up in a zoo, right? So that is what we call a stanza. Next word is assonance. Now, assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds within non-rhyming words. So we know vowels to be A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. But when we look at assonance, it specifically focuses on the the repetition of that vowel sound, mellow, wedding, bells. The vowel is E, mellow, wedding, bells on proud, rounding clouds, twice in the high night. So when you look at the, the forms of assonance, those non-rhyming words, but they have a sound, that vowel sound is consistent, that E sound, that O-U sound, that I sound, those are vowel sounds. Now we have alliteration. Alliteration is one of my favorite literary devices. It is the occurrence of the same letter or the sound at the beginning of an adjacent or collect, uh, closely connected words. For example, Sally sold seashells by the seashore. A lot of times we find tongue ties in alliteration. Or Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Though I can never get that one. So both are forms of alliteration. So Sally sold seashells by the seashore. We see that the same S sound is consistent. Or Peter Piper picked a peck. Oh, I can all, I always mess that one up. Peter Piper picked a peck of, pe- of pickled peppers. Those are both perfect examples of alliteration. All right, and our last and final word is end rhyme. The form of rhyme, and as you can see there, the T is missing there. It's supposed to be the form. The form of rhyme, rhyming, which uses the sameness of sound of the last words of lines from the vowels in the stress syllables to their end. So, for example, this poem, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, How I Wonder What You Are. Star and R are rhyming words because both are end, end rhyme words, right? Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. What two words rhyme? High in sky. When the traveler in the dark thanks you for this tiny spark, dark and spark. And Ryan, capiche? You got it? Good. Now we're going to get into our writing.
All right. Let's get into our writing. So with our writing here, I mean, our reading, excuse me, we're going to get into our reading. So we're going to be reading a story called Eleven by Sandra Cisnettos. It's one of my favorite stories to read to my seventh graders every year. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to make sure you are annotating, looking for the questions, looking for the um, the schemas, making predictions. I still want to see your annotations. Those of you who have been turning your annotations, I am extremely proud of you because you have demonstrated that you are still reading and adding points. So that is good. Let's take a look at our story. 11 by Sandra Cisnettos. I'm going to read it with you and I want you guys to annotate. If you need to pause the video for any time to annotate, feel free to do that. There's no judgment here. What they don't understand about birthdays and what they never tell you is that when you're 11, you're also 10 and 9 and 8 and 7 and 6 and 5 and 4 and 3 and 2 and 1. And when you wake up on your 11th birthday, you expect to feel 11, but you don't. You open your eyes and everything's just like yesterday, only it's today. And you don't feel 11 at all. You feel like you're still 10, and you are underneath the year that makes you 11. Like some days, you might say something stupid, and that's a part of you still being 10. Or maybe some days, you might feel you might need to sit on your mama's lap because you're scared. And that's the part of that that's five. And maybe one day when you're all grown up, and maybe you'll need to cry like if you were three, and that's okay. That's what I tell mama when, she sat, when she's sad and needs to cry. But she's feeling three. Trust me, when you get older, some things just never change. You still show love to your parents. I love my mom. Even though when I feel down or I feel lonely, I still call her and I still need to ask her for help sometimes. Because the way you grow old is kind of like an onion or like the rings inside a tree trunk or like my little wooden dolls that fit on the side of the other. Each year inside the next one. That's how being 11 years old is. You don't feel 11, not right away. It takes a few days, weeks even, sometimes even months before you say 11 when they ask you. And you don't feel smart 11, not until you're almost 12. That, the, that's the way it is. Only today I wish I didn't have only 11 years rattling inside me like pennies in a tin band-aid box. Today, I wish I was only 102 instead of 11 because I was on, I was 102. I know what to say when Mrs. Price put the red sweater on my desk. I wouldn't know how to tell her if it wasn't mine instead of just sitting there with that look on my face and nothing coming out of my mouth. Whose is this? Mrs. Price says, and she holds the red sweater up in the air for all the class to see. Whose? It's been sitting in the coat room for a month. Not mine, she says. Everybody, not me. It has to be long to somebody, Mrs. Price keeps saying, but nobody can remember. It's an ugly sweater with red plastic buttons and a collar and sleeves all stretched out like you could use it for jump rope. It's maybe a thousand years old, and even if it belonged to me, I wouldn't say so. Maybe because I'm skinny. Maybe because she doesn't like me. That stupid Sylvia Sal uh, Salvadivad says, I think it belongs to Rachel. An ugly sweater like that. All raggedy, old, but Mrs. Price believes her. Mrs. Price takes the sweater and puts it right on my desk. But when I open my mouth, nothing comes out. That's not... I don't... You're not... Not mine. I finally say in a little voice that was... Maybe me when I was four. Of course it is yours, Mrs. Price says. I remember you wearing it once because she's older and the teacher. She's right and I'm not. Not mine, not mine. But Mrs. Price is already turning to page 32 in the math problem number four. I don't know why, but all of a sudden I'm feeling sick inside. Like that part of me that's three wants to come out of my eyes. Only I squeeze them shut tight and bite down on my teeth real hard and try to remember today I am 11. 11! Mama's making a cake for me for tonight. And when Papa comes home, everybody will sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. But when the sick eyes, when the sick feeling goes away, I open my eyes. 
the red sweater feeling sitting there like a big red mountain. I moved the red sweater to the, the corner of my desk with my ruler. I moved my pencil and books and eraser as far from it as possible. I even moved my chair a little to the right. Not mine, not mine, not mine. In my head, I'm thinking how long till lunchtime, how long till I could take the red sweater and throw it over the schoolyard fence or leave it hanging on the parking meter or bunch it up into a little ball and toss it into the alley. Except when math period ends, Mrs. Price says loud in front of everybody, now Rachel, that's enough. Because she sees I've shoved the red sweater in the tippy tip corner of my desk and it's hanging all over the edge like a waterfall, but I don't care, Rachel. Mrs. Price says. She says it like she's getting mad. You put on that sweater right now and no more nonsense. But it's not. Now, Mrs. Price says, this is when I wish I was, wasn't 11 because all the years inside me, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, are pushing at the back of my eyes. When I put one arm through one sleeve of the sweater that smells like cottage cheese in the other arm through the other and stand there with my arms apart like if the sweater hurts me and it does all itchy and full of germs that aren't even mine that's when everything i've been holding in since the morning since when mrs price put on the sweater on my desk finally lets go and all of a sudden i'm crying in front of everybody i was i wish i was invisible but i'm not I'm 11 and it's my birthday today and I'm crying like I was three in front of everybody. I put my head down on my desk and bury my face in the stupid clown sweater arms, my face all hot and spit coming out of my mouth because I can't stop the little animal noises from coming out of me until there aren't any more tears in my eyes. And it's just my body shaking like when you have the hiccups. And my whole head hurts like when you drink lots of milk way too fast. But the worst part is right before the bell rings for lunch, that stupid Phyllis Lopez, who even who is even dumber than Sylvia Saldivar, says she remembers the red sweater is hers. I take it off right away and give it to her. Only Mrs. Price pretends like everything's okay. Today I'm 11. There's a cake Mama's making for, for me tonight. And when Papa comes home from work, we'll eat it. There'll be candles, presents, and everybody will sing happy birthday, happy birthday to you, Rachel. Only it's too late. I'm 11 today. I'm 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. But I wish I was 102. I wish I was anything but 11 because I want today to be far away already. Far away like a runaway balloon. Like a tiny O in the sky. So tiny, tiny. You have to close your eyes to see it. Now... We are in a situation, this young lady is frustrated. I'm 11. I shouldn't have what? What is she saying, pretty much? If she's 11 years old, she's pretty much saying, I shouldn't have emotions. I shouldn't feel bad. I shouldn't do these things because I'm older. I'm a big kid. I shouldn't feel crappy. I shouldn't feel sad. I shouldn't feel a certain way. I should feel strong. I should be powerful. I shouldn't show emotion. But is that true? I don't think that's true. Because no matter how old you are, everyone has emotions. Everyone cries. Everyone gets angry. Everyone gets happy. Everyone experiences something different. And it's crazy that something as little as this sweater has her thinking that she is not supposed to have emotion, that she's not supposed to feel a certain way, that she's not supposed to be emotionally drained, that she's not supposed to cry. She's blaming it on being the baby, but in reality, those are your true emotions. Let's take a look. So now let's look at our writing reflection. In our writing reflection, it is important for us to have um, a central idea, figure out what the central idea is, what is the author's purpose? And then what are some schemas we have, right? And we're supposed to connect that into two full body paragraphs to help us make this work. So when we look at the central idea, we obviously know the central idea is young girl earns 
11 years old and does whatever she can in order for her to fight her feelings. So a young girl turns 11 years old and does whatever she can to fight her feelings. Or she tries, or we could say that she tries not to cry. Sorry for my bad typing. Okay. Now, when we think about the author's purpose and theme, what do you think the author wants us to get out of this? Or what is the underlying message, like a theme of the text? We just discussed it. It does not matter how old you are. You are still able to have emotions. This reminds me of how, when I was 12 years old. I remember I got in trouble one day. I, I think my mother expected me and my brother to get home by a certain time. We decided to take a detour. And my mother was upset when we got in trouble. But I thought in my head that at the age of 12, there was no way I was supposed to get in trouble anymore. I was not supposed to get in trouble with my mom anymore. I was not supposed to get emotional when my mother got in, when I got in trouble with my mom. I was not supposed to cry because that's what babies did. That's what young kids did. That's what kids at 11, 10, and 9 did. So I never wanted to cry while my mother would be disciplining me because I felt like that's what little kids did. I was older. I didn't do that. I didn't show emotion, you know? And I think that cracks me up because when I look at this story, it brings me back to the time when my mother raised was raising me as a little kid, me and my brother, and she really, you know, she got upset with us and we got in trouble and she had to discipline us. And I thought that I could not cry. There was no way I could cry. There was no way I was supposed to show emotion because that's what little kids did. But that's not true, right? Everyone shows emotion. Everyone feels bad when they make a mistake. Everyone goes through something like that, right? So, all right, here in the, in the, in the, um, in the abbreviations, Mr. McMillan's story about me. You guys, please do not judge my typing tonight, <laughs> today. About being 12 years old. Right? So I'll talk about my, so that'll be my schema. That'll be the thing that I'll add to my, um, to my writing. And obviously in our written reflection, all I want is one paragraph now. Um, I know before I've asked for multiple paragraphs, but all I need is one. And the reason why I'm asking for one paragraph is simply because I feel that you guys don't need to overwork yourself. Let me go over something with you real quick before we end class. So inside of your um Inside of your Google Classroom folder, you should see that I've given you a Mr. McMillan's Digital ELA class um, schedule. And this is how the schedule is going to look for us each and every week. All right. So day, so I write here, I say, dear scholars, daily I'm working hard to ensure that you are getting the best education as you can. That's my job as your teacher. And remember, the sky is the limit that you can have anything you want in life. This document will give you everything you need for the month of April. This is how you will be able to distance learn for the month. You have a weekly routine, which will be the expectations week, uh, which will be expected, uh, sorry. You have a weekly routine, which will be the expectations weekly. You can also see the monthly reading schedule and due dates. YouTube videos will be posted daily, and that will include lessons on Mondays and Wednesdays, the motivational videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Friday is a day when you do your assignments and your assessment quiz. So we will have quizzes every Friday on Google Classroom, vocabulary or 
uh, comprehension quizzes on Google Classroom. The following Monday is when you will turn in all of your assignments, okay? Here's another thing. Every Monday and Wednesday, the lesson's going to be a bit different for this month, for this, for this month together. So Monday is when we will journal and we'll do our short reading. I said two, but we're only doing one. And our comprehension questions and our vocabulary. You will just pretty much follow along with the PowerPoint. Tuesday is nothing on Tuesday. That's your day when you're going to be with your history and math teacher. And you are just going to journal that day. You're going to keep journaling. But um, I will be posting a motivational uh, video, inspirational moment video. Wednesday is uh, when we're going to be focusing on a new thing called poetry. I'm going to teach you guys about poetry, comprehension, and reviewing vocabulary. And then Thursday is going to be the same as Tuesday. And Friday will just be your assessment. All right. So let's take a look at what we have planned for this week. All right. So for this week or for the, the first April, May month, but this week, we're going to, the reading is 11 by Sandra Cisneros. These are your vocabulary words. And you remember, you have gotten a bonus word if you watch the full YouTube, but at this point, you probably have watched it all. The assignment is to have your vocabulary sheet done, read and annotate the passage, and your written response. And that is due to me on Monday. Those are three things that are due to me on Monday. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to be friendly and kind and just ask for your vocabulary and your written response. Okay? That's due on Monday. Wednesday, you're going to have, we're actually going to read the poem from The Outsiders, the actual Robert Frost poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay. You're going to read the poem, and I'm going to have some questions for you to answer as we read. That's going to be due on Monday as well. There are only going to be three things that you need to turn into me on Monday. Your vocabulary sheet your written response for your, for your reading, and the questions from the poem. Are we clear? I hope you are. Thank you guys for being so supportive. And I know this is a lot on you guys. And I know you guys are a little overwhelmed by everything that is going on in the world today. But you guys are troopers. You guys have been holding it down. And you guys have been doing so well with turning in your work. Please know that all grades have been submitted. And I will have them uploaded on Power School by this afternoon. So by 12 p.m., you should see all of your updated grade bumps based on the assignments you've done at the beginning of our first wave of social distancing. Thank you guys and have a fantastic Monday and we will catch up. We will catch up. We will catch up soon. All right. Bye.